Empowering Teaching Excellence Podcast, Episode 1. Hi, welcome to Episode 1 of the ETE Podcast, Considerations in Online Course Design. We're here today with Courtney Stewart, and I'm Erin Wadsworth-Anderson. And I'm Travis Thurston, and we're going to get started with some of the tips that are offered in this paper. Uh, so tip number one today, we're going to talk about have, having students work collaboratively and actively. Um, one of the points they bring up in the paper is that the best online instruction allows students' learning to be forged through interaction uh, with each other and with the instructor. Well, really, that's one of the biggest uh, negative criticisms of online from my students is they don't get the interaction or active participation with other students. But that doesn't mean you can't do that in online learning. Do you think Absolutely. it really depends on the effort that the students put forth, or do you think it's more on the teacher? I think it's uh, probably the students. They can engage as much as they want to or as little as they want to just to meet the requirements of the course, but it's really up to the teacher to facilitate that. But you're right. I mean, students can get as much or more out of it than they put in. Yeah, absolutely. And I, one of the things they bring up as well is that you can structure your course to, to be able to facilitate it. There are things you can do before the course starts uh, to really create that environment to allow students to collaborate. Yeah. Do you think at a certain point students really don't want that interaction? If they're taking an online course, they might be in their own element and maybe they just want to get things done and not have that kind of interaction? Do you, I, you run across that? I think there's students that are the same. They would be in a classroom where they're more introverted or more isolated and they want to just be left alone. I think yeah. that's that kind of transfers over to an online setting where in a social activity, those maybe face-to-face -face classroom students may come out more in an online mm -hmm. setting because they feel more comfortable. Yeah. Those that have a more bigger personality that can't really show through online maybe kind of withdraw a little because they can't engage in that. So I think there's some both. Yeah. I, and I think that's an interesting point because when we do create online courses, uh, per the Department of Education, we're supposed to create substantive interaction between students and instructors within those courses. Um, so that is something that we're trying to push with the students, whether or not they're really interested in doing that. But that brings up an issue that I may have, is that the instructor is the sole person for all knowledge. And I don't necessarily agree that, because in the online classes, they need to be free to build that own, their own knowledge on their own. That's the joy or the benefit of an online class, is you give them the prompts where to go, and they can construct that knowledge on their own. So they shouldn't rely yeah. solely on the instructor in no. the online. That's where that collaborative part where they learn together, but also online in the virtual world. Everything I agree. Out there. And that actually leads us into tip number three, which is to make student interaction uh, with the instructor and creating your own social presence as the instructor. Um, so this is the concept of, of really framing how you, are, as the instructor, are going to interact with your students, right? How you're going to respond to them via email, your expectations for their social presence uh, in discussions, and, and really uh, framing that up front. And do you want to do that in the syllabus or do you want to set that benchmark maybe in your first discussion or assignment or something like that? I feel like I can set that tone um, in that first kind of discussion mm -hmm. and that's a way to not only learn how to participate in the discussion but also learn how the class is going to operate or engage with that discussion and I kind of set that tone for me they're going to expect how many responses or how I respond I feel if I put that in my syllabus or even in an email it's a little not authentic right. you know yeah. because oh I'm going to respond within 24 hours or I'm going to have three lines so I feel yeah. a little formulaic but I, I think you can have it. I think you should have it in your syllabus or even in a start here type page. Yeah. But if you have a first discussion, like an icebreaker type discussion, that gives you an opportunity not only to allow the students to get to know each other, but also for you to show them how this is going to work throughout the semester. Right. This is a discussion. You're going to interact. You're going to post, and then you're going to make comments to your peers. And, and you can use that icebreaker as a way to model what your expectations are for them throughout the rest of the semester. And would you be explicit in your instructions in that? So would you say to people, 
in your discussion when you're responding, this is how I will usually respond, or do you just kind of leave it up to the students to make that connection in their head? My teacher's going to respond this way. I need to do this in order to get this response. I don't know. Does that? Mm -hmm. I, I think you know what you mentioned is having it in the syllabus. I think that may be the minimum or at least the beginning expectation. But I think what you're talking about in that discussion is showing it in action and right. what it will look like. Okay. Um, and I think leaving it open to maybe going above and beyond in a comment discussion rather than just having a minimum, I need three lines or a paragraph, uh, allows them flexibility of how they're going to engage. Right. Okay. That, that question about connections is a good one because it leads you right into tip number two. So tip number two, have students make connections between concepts. I think when in online learning, we are, especially in higher education and in maybe a graduate program, you're assuming that your students have a substantive background, substantial background knowledge. Mm -hmm. So when they're coming in and they're making connections between these concepts, it's easy maybe to assume that they're going to know a little bit about these concepts before you even introduce them. Is that something that... Well, what I found in my 6280 class is they don't necessarily have the construct or the idea or the theoretical idea in place, um, but they have experience yeah. and they have practical application of that. And so pinpointing what they've done or lived mm -hmm. with a theoretical construct helps them make that connection. Right. That, oh, I do this, but now there's literature to support that or explain that. And that's one way that I think I've tried to connect those dots for them with their practice. Because a, a lot of them have great experience, mm -hmm. and you don't want to discredit that. Right. That's, that's perfect. They actually addressed that in this paper, talking about uh, taking concepts uh, that the students uh, may or may not be familiar with and then applying them to things that they're, they've been doing in the workplace or their own personal experience. And that brings in uh, Vygotsky's ZPD, or Zone of Proximal Development, right. right? So we're wanting them to really engage the content uh, in different ways, not only learning from the course, but also applying it to their own experiences. Well, and then with that interaction from the instructor, then that Zone of Proximal Development gets a little bit more robust. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, Courtney, we actually have a, a video clip from uh, you participating in uh, the ETE conference in a mm -hmm. panel a couple of years ago uh, addressing uh, tip number five, where we talk about making sure your learning outcomes are appropriate for your technology. And, and you relate this more to uh, using assessment mm -hmm. in your class. I actually have a love-hate relationship with assessment because I was not too long ago on the other end of that receiving the brunt of every assessment thrown at me from my college professor. So I really tried to take the view of authentic assessment. And unfortunately, or fortunately, um, I teach a lot of my classes online. And so I've tried to build that into my online classes, incorporating both two different types, a formative and a summative assessment. The point here is that different technologies will afford different learning experiences. So how have you done that in your class? Well, in my 6280 online course, I've tried to really bring the student into having a choice as the, the way they learn. And so they can receive content in different modalities. And so flipping that on the other end of how to assess that, I also give them choice in how they're being assessed. So using formative assessments to kind of assure that they're getting it as they're going through it, but then summatives to show me that they learned what they were supposed to get throughout the module. So in our course, you know, uh, they can actually participate and submit a video as an assessment or an audio podcast or even create a project and submit it back to us as a, a type of assessment. Do you find that they're more apt to participate if you give them those different options? Definitely. They, I, I, when you give them the flexibility to try new things, the creativity skyrockets. Where if I give them a one-page paper, that's what I get, is a stagnate one-page paper. But if you allow them to try new things, they will. And those that are willing, you know, just like we were talking about before, uh, th those that want to participate and go above and beyond will. Right. Uh, and they find the fun in it, and they find the creativity in it. Yeah. I know personally, I would have loved to have the option to submit a video of me talking about something because I feel that I can verbalize a little more than I can write on a mm -hmm. paper. So. 
And I've seen that in this course, the students. And then when I give them feedback on their video, it's in a video format. So I mirror yeah. my feedback to their assessment as well. And they really appreciate that because that's their preferred method right. at that time. And they really enjoy and benefit from that. Yeah, so, so do you feel like the technology gets in the way of you uh, facilitating that in your course? Or have you been able to utilize the technology that is available uh, to really make that work? Um, the only way I see it, it uh, kind of getting in, in the middle of it or preventing it is on the student end. They're not familiar with it. And me being on the instructor side and very familiar with it, I don't see it as a roadblock at all. Uh, the only roadblock I see are the preventive part of it is helping the students learn how to utilize, how to record a good video and post it, you know, without taking five, ten times to record it. And so that, that's the only thing is on the student end is bringing them up to speed of how to do it. Oh, that's perfect. That actually leads us into tip number seven. So tip seven says prepare your students technologically. And we've talked about this a little bit before. You want to make sure that your students know how to use the technology that, that you're um, presenting or that you're having them use in the course. Um, but we've also talked about students who don't have the technology. Mm -hmm. How do we kind of overcome that burden or that road bump? Yeah, so in the paper they talk about how some schools actually use a, a Start Here page or um, something of that nature mm -hmm. that provides resources and links uh, to technology, to helps for technology. Yeah. Well, I was just going to mention that, you know, when you're the teacher, sometimes you feel like you're the source of all knowledge. Like, you have to be able to provide every answer. And so when they have a tech problem, you want to be the one to solve that. Right. And so I've had to learn to relinquish that and say, oh, there's a perfect video made by our support people. Or there's a great person you can call that will help you and know way more than I know. Or here's an instructional video of how to make a video. So mm -hmm. uh, as an online teacher, I've had to relinquish that source of all knowledge and you know support and then utilize what I can. That's good. That actually relates to uh, what, what Julie Salmon calls uh, the five-stage model. And it's, it's really creating this, um, this architecture of engagement. And it allows students, allows you as the instructor to actually um, create a framework or scaffolding to build the students up from either their lack of tech, tech, knowledge of the technology um, or knowledge of, of really how to interact in the technology to be able to get them to the point where they can co-construct knowledge with their peers and, and really to get those to those higher level of blooms. Right. Well, and the thing that's hard with technology is that it's sticking around. So if people are resistant to the use of technology, that becomes a little bit difficult in itself. And I think so many students and faculty members kind of sell, their, sell themselves short on their, the knowledge that they have on technology by saying, oh, I'm just not technologically savvy, mm -hmm. or I don't know how to do this. I think that learning by practicing is so important, and that's why it's great that we're integrating this technology into courses, because obviously you have to use technology in an online learning environment. So That happens in a face-to-face -face course. A student won't likely participate in a Spanish class till they have the language to do so. Right. They're going to be intimidated or afraid, or even in a math class or in an English class, till they have that understanding of how to communicate with everybody else. And so that's the same in a technology environment, online learning. To really feel comfortable engaging in that, we mm -hmm. need to learn the, the, the words, the phrases, and, or right. even the methods of how to participate. Yep. This has been a, a great discussion. It has. Uh, thanks for watching the first episode of the ETE podcast on uh, considerations for online course design. I want to thank Courtney Stewart for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. It's been great. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Also, subscribe to our channel for more empowering teaching excellence videos.